So I love Pokemon. And Pokemon did something really cool to change things up. No, they forgot about that one. They forgot about that one too. Okay. No, I mean the Alolan forms. Take some classic Pokemon from the first generation, change them up a little bit, and make them new and exciting. And it's extra fun because this is something that happens in the real world too. When an animal is moved to a new environment, it'll naturally evolve to better survive. It might change to fit a different weather pattern, or to hunt its prey better, or to hide from predators better. So I got to thinking, what environmental changes cause the Pokemon to change their appearance and type so drastically? So let's take a closer look at each of the alone forms to see what caused them to evolve. Well, not like normal Pokemon evolve, more like adapt, I guess. Anyways, let's get started. I think the Rattata family would be the best place to start, but before we take a look at their Alolan forms, we should check out how they live in their Kanto environment. Let's start with Rattata. I'm sure the first thing you'll notice is this adorable pinkish purple color. Animals in nature have bright and easy to see colors as a sign of danger. They don't want other animals to bother them, so the bright colors let everyone know it's dangerous to mess with them. And Rattata is pretty dangerous. Rattata are mostly found near the beginning of the games, in those areas, there aren't really a ton of Pokemon who could serve as much of a threat for Rattata. But, this little pink boy is definitely something everyone else should be afraid of. A Caterpie's little string shot or a Pidgey's little talon is nothing compared to these chompers. Rattata's bite would be cause for alarm for both Pokemon and human alike. So if you're out in the wild and notice that pink curly tail sticking out of the grass, you know to watch out for those giant teeth. However, things all change when Rattata evolves into Eradicate. The bright pink color is gone because now Eradicate needs to be able to hide from others. With their evolutions giving them much more powerful attacks and defenses, Radcade's big teeth don't feel like much of a threat anymore. Instead now, it would seem like this pudgy little rat would make quite a nice meal to many of the predator Pokemon found in the area. So Radicate has this dusty brown coat to better hide among the sandy wheat fields and grasslands of Kanto. So now that we know why they look this way in Kanto, we can start figuring out how their Alolan forms got these dark black coats and adopted the dark typing. Upon being introduced to the islands of Alola, they would have been faced with a threat of an even worse bite than their own, Young Goose and Gumshoes. Suddenly, Rattata and Radicate aren't the top dogs in the area anymore. Young Goose and Gumshoes have even scarier teeth than our little rat family, and on top of that, Young Goose loves picking fights. So in order to avoid these fighty boys, the Rattata line would have started becoming more and more nocturnal. Young Goose and Gumshoes only come out during the day, so nighttime would be the only time the Rattatas and Radicates could go out without being disturbed. In order to blend in better with the nocturnal setting, the two would have adapted darker and darker coats to a better camouflage. Rattata now stands on its hind legs, making it easier to fight the low to the ground Young Goose in case of an actual fight occurring. And Radicate becomes thicker and chunkier to have better defenses against its heavy set adversaries. And that explains the Radicate line. Let's look at the Meowth line next, because their changes probably mirrored the Radicate family. In Kanto, Meowth and Persian have tan fur to better blend in. Just like Radicate's dusty fur, the Meowth line is capable of blending into its environment. It's so the prey can't see them while they're hunting, and that prey would include a nice fat Radicate. As you know, cats chase mice, so when one of their best sources of food started turning nocturnal in Alola, it's only natural that Meowth family would follow suit. Also adopting the darker fur to better blend in at night, and it seems becoming nocturnal turns a Pokemon dark type, or at the very least turns a normal type Pokemon dark type. And with Persian, I'm sure you noticed it's extra-sized head. <laughs> well, it would make sense that if Radicate is changing to be stockier to fight Gumshoes, Persian would also have to get some beef to defend itself from those bitey rat teeth. Let's shift gears and take a look at the worst Alolan forms, the Muck family. I think they're just so ugly. So how does this little purple blob become this Technicolor nightmare? Well, as I explained in the games, its diet changed. Grimers and Muck consume waste, and there's two different forms that they are known to eat. Natural waste, mold, compost, feces, and man-made wastes, oil, chemicals, and trash. Grimers and mucks are like little natural garbage disposals. They take the waste they consume and convert it into poisons in its own body, which then they use as a defense mechanism. Kanto Grimer is found in very populated areas with a lot of industry. There is more man-made waste to consume there, and it turns their bodies purple. The toxic chemicals found in our pollution are often darker colors compared to the bright rainbow of natural wastes. Fungus and decaying plants come in a wide, bright range of colors, and in turn, Grimer and Muck's colors turn brighter too. It's sort of similar to flamingos. They're born with white feathers, but after eating their hefty diet of shrimp, the Canthaxian and the shrimp dye their feathers into that iconic pink color. Interestingly, I think the Alolan Grimer is probably the original form for these Pokemon, 
and they only changed once in Kanto. Alola doesn't have nearly as much infrastructure as Kanto does, so it's a lot closer to a natural environment. With the rise in pollution and industry in the Kanto region, Grimer and Muck would have had to change their dietary habits to accommodate the man-made waste taking over their environment. Next, we'll take a look at both Sancher's line and Vulpix's line together, as they probably changed in tandem with each other. There are no deserts in Kanto, but there are a good amount of mountains, caves, and other rocky terrains that these two tend to call home. The question is, why didn't they decide to live in the Alolan desert once being introduced into the region? Well, there's a couple of reasons to that. First, let's take a look at other Pokemon found in the same areas Vulpix and Sandshrew live as in Kanto. None of these Pokemon could really pose much of a threat to these two. Sandshrew's hard shell would keep it safe, and Vulpix is one of the few fire types found in the areas other than Cinnabar. The other Pokemon wouldn't stand a chance against them. But now, take a look at the Alolan Desert. Trapinch, Garchomp, Dugtrio. These are Pokey powerhouses. On top of that, look at the rest of the island. There are so many water type Pokemon in the area. The best option for these two would be to travel to the snowy mountains of Alola. There are strong Pokemon there, but these Pokemon all tend to be rather reclusive. They don't hang around near others, so Vulpix and Sandshrew lines would be able to find some safety. And also, there's an abundance of tall grass to live in. In Kanto, these two always live in tall grass. The only exception being Vulpix living in the mansion ruins of Cinnabar. These two would have nowhere to go in the desert because there's no grass for them to live in. But the nearby mountaintop does and they would adapt to their new colder climate by getting thicker fur and achieving the ice typing. The only other thing is how Ninetales got the fairy typing too, but fire type Ninetales has been shown to have ghost-like powers. Maybe turning ice type made those ghost powers seem more like fairy and they got stronger in the colder environment. Now let's take a look at the fabulous Alolan Diglett family. That golden hair is pretty striking, but how did it happen? Well, a lot of their descriptions in game call their hairs whiskers, similar to a cat. Cat's whiskers are used as feelers, sensing things that are out of their line of vision. And Diglett use these in the same way. They poke their whiskers out of the ground to feel if there's any danger nearby. Diglett are actually very sensitive to the sun, so being able to tell the weather or temperature above ground without having to pop your whole face out would be very beneficial. They have other descriptions that actually talk about how they got their whiskers in the first place. An abundance of iron from volcanic rock. The Alolan Diglett and Ductrio both eat and live within the volcanic rock in the soil. The iron in their bodies then converted into golden hairs from their heads. My question is, why doesn't the Kanto Diglett live near Cinnabar then? I suppose an easy answer would be, Cinnabar is an island and it's kind of hard for a couple of ground types to tunnel their way through the ocean. But that's boring. Instead, let's take an exciting look at basalt. Basalt is the primary rock you'll find from a volcanic activity and it's loaded with tons of minerals including iron, magnesium, and calcium. Not only is it the most common volcanic rock to find, it's also the primary rock layer of the Hawaiian Islands. Alola is obviously inspired by the Pacific Islands, Hawaii especially, meaning the Dictria line doesn't even need to live near the volcano to get the iron-enriched basalts. The whole of the island is packed full of the stuff, giving them the iron they need to get that long, luscious hair of theirs. While we're on our Earth, boys, let's shift gears and take a look at the Geodude line. Similar to Diglett and Grimer, I think Geodude's line changed due to their change in the minerals they live in and the change in their diet. They eat rocks, but there's a big difference in what kind of rocks they feast on between Alola and Kanto. In Kanto, they eat mossy stones, but in Alola, their diet has changed to a stone called Dravite. Dravite, also known as brown tourmaline, it's a metamorphic and an igneous rock, which are both commonplace near volcanoes. But the really cool part about this is when we start taking a closer look at the tourmaline family. Tourmaline can come in a wide variety of colors depending on different levels of heat applied to the stone. Which, I'm gonna be honest, kind of makes it a bummer they didn't play around with this idea for the Alolan Golems family's shiny forms. But whatever. But more importantly, tourmaline is a pyroelectric and piezoelectric, meaning when it's put under enough pressure, it sets off an electric charge attaching dust particles to itself. This perfectly explains their new electric typing. Also with this, they're now more electromagnetic, so magnetic particles and metals stick to their bodies, explaining the awesome new mustache goal I'm sporting now. All that's left to talk about are the three Pokemon who only their evolutions got Alolan forms. So it's interesting, their living conditions were close enough that their first stages remained the same as in Kanto, but something different for their evolutions to change. Let's start with Marowak. What would keep Cubone the same but change Marowak into a fire ghost type? Well, let's take a closer look at Cubone for a start. 
Cubone are primarily found in caves and tunnels, however they seem to always avoid tunnels with Diglett and Dugtrio. There are several caves in Alola, but they all either have Diglett, Dugtrio, or an abundance of water-type Pokémon. Cubone instead made their home near Wella Park, at the foot of a volcano. Now why would they choose to live here? Simple. The Kangaskhan. Cubone will occasionally cry for help, and on a rare chance, a Kangaskhan will show up to aid it. Cubone do have few similarities with a baby Kangaskhan. Kangaskhan in the area probably take in these orphaned Cubones, keeping them safe, and that would explain why they look the same both in Alola and Kanto. But once it evolves, Kangaskhan probably won't see a need to protect it anymore. So now what happens with the new Marowak alone in an active volcano? Well, the obvious answer is, it would need to evolve the fire type to sustain itself next to the volcanic surroundings. It grew longer arms, so it can hold the fire a safe distance from itself, and adapted to having darker reddish skin to better blend into the volcanic rock surrounding them. Now the question is, where does that ghost typing come from? Cubone have always had a very close relationship with death. Their mothers die at their birth, and Kanto Cubone are found living in the Pokemon Tower, the graveyard for dead Pokemon. What if that ghost typing came naturally to them, harnessing their death-filled lives to fuel a connection to the afterlife and the spirits found there? Next, let's take a look at the big boy Executor. Execute seem to be really hardy little seeds. Not eggs, they're seeds. It was just an easy pun to name them after eggs. They can be found all over the place in different games, but in Kanto they're only found in the Safari Zone. Which makes me think they're not originally indigenous to Kanto, and they were only moved there to be part of an exotic, fun safari zone. Regardless, they seem to be able to thrive in most all environments, and that concept of thriving carried on to Exeggutor. The strong nutrients and healthier surroundings have made Exeggutor shoot up in height. More nutrients means it can grow more limbs, and an extra head too. Now the big question is, where in the world did that dragon typing come from? Now it makes sense for Exeggutor to have psychic type in the earlier regions. Dragon types are strong, but they're very rare to find, especially in Kanto. Instead, the psychic types were the powerhouses in many of those earliest regions. But psychic types aren't as powerful in the Alolan Islands. There are a lot more dark types, ghost types, and stronger bug types than found in Kanto. And it's implied that they had that dragon powers lying dormant inside of them. Abandoning the psychic powers allowed the dragon typing to come to life. And finally, let's end this discussion with our little Pokestar, Pikachu and Raichu. It makes sense, Pikachu would remain the same in Alola. Not only is Pikachu a strong little shocking boy, but he's massively popular. Even in the universe of Pokemon, Pikachu is a very loved and popular Pokemon. Now there's a description that states Raichu changed due to its diet, and another description mentions a sweet smell from its cheeks. But there's nothing confirming what this special psychic diet would be. Maybe masala? Maybe some natural fruits? It seems like this change for Raichu came about for no other reason. Nothing predatorial would offer a threat to the Raichu's original form to begin with. The softer features on its ears and tail was probably a side effect from adopting the psychic type. However, there is one thing I don't think necessarily came around naturally. It's blue eyes. I can't imagine it would come around due to the type change. In fact, most psychic types have very dark colored eyes. So how did Raichu get this very opposite eye color from normal? Blue eyes are a very recessive trait, meaning if you have a parent with brown eyes and a parent with blue eyes, the odds are far more in the favor that your eyes are also going to be brown. Well, there is the way Raichu would have gotten these big baby blues. Breeding. People breed animals for aesthetic purposes all the time. That's how wolves became tiny adorable lap dogs. They were bred to fit a certain physical want. And while blue eyes are rarer, it's not entirely unheard of, even with Pikachu. In the anime, we meet a Pikachu who loves to surf and has blue eyes. I wouldn't be surprised if that same Pikachu surfed his way with his trainer to Alola and evolved into an Alolan Raichu. Maybe Raichus had darker eyes commonly, but this blue-eyed Raichu was just so eye-catching to them that they started to breed to make the blue eyes the default. After all, if you want to have one of the most popular Pokémon, don't you want them to be as adorable as possible? And that was all of them. The Alolan forms are really unique, and I think it's a really great direction for the games to go. Breathe some new life into old Pokemon. I remember the first time I played a Pokemon game, I booted up Gold version, my green Game Boy Color, and the first Pokemon I caught and trained on my team was a little pink Rattata I named Pinky. And coming to Sun version, turning it on, and seeing this crazy new black Rattata sparked that old love I used to feel for the little rat Pokemon. I know a lot of people are on the fence about Sword and Shield, but I am honestly super excited for it. I can't wait to play it, have fun, go on an adventure, and maybe even fall in love with some new and old Pokemon all over again. 
I hope you liked that video. I had a ton of fun getting to talk about Pokemon here. I have a Patreon, so if you want to help support me, you can find the link in the screen and in the description. Any and all support is greatly appreciated. Let me know if you had any different theories and tell me what your favorite Pokemon is. What's your favorite Alolan form? What Pokemon would you like to see get a form change? Any and all thoughts, go ahead and leave them in the comments below. And I'll see you next time. Bye bye.